I'm going to share as I was trying to find a story that would illustrate the sermon and how we are. When I found this one, I had to chuckle to myself because I found where people had wrote in true stories. And this lady wrote this one in, and I laughed because I thought, how many times, <laughs> maybe not this exact thing, but how many times we could do something like this. She had baked a cake for the family, and they were all sitting in the living room, and, and uh, she, they were all going to do their separate things. And she said, well, I'm going to go in there and have a piece of that cake. Well, she said that piece of that cake shortly thereafter led to her eating half the cake. And she said, I got to looking at it, and she said, I got embarrassed about what I'd done. So I ate the other half, and I baked a new one so no one would know. And then she realized, well, I told him I was going to eat a piece, so she ate a piece of the new cake she baked. And she said, all was well till supper that night, and she said, I threw up on the floor. <laughs> Can't we talk ourselves into some pretty stupid stuff? I've been there, and I bet you have too. <clears throat> but she had an excess of cake. Excess is an amount of something that is more than necessary, <laughs> permitted or desirable. But listen to this last part. Lack of moderation. Have you ever seen a time in our world where there's less of a lack of moderation? You see it in the way people dress. You see it in the shows on television, what you hear, what you see. Uh, if you've got a computer, God help you. You know if you're on the Internet for any reason, some of the pop-ups that come up are just unbelievable. And some of the things you see and hear, and, you know, one of the biggest things uh, at the school every year, <laughs> and folks, <laughs> unbelievably, but you end up fighting with the parents, over the dress code at the prom. We get more chewings because we do not want their daughters to look like prostitutes than anything I've ever seen in my life. And for people to come up there and jump on us for wanting us, <laughs> for people to dress moderately, blows my mind. But folks, that's how we are headed. And to see, you know, I, <laughs> I just tell them, there, if... There's no way my child would have left the house like that. Now, they might have left the house and changed on me, but I don't think so. Uh, but there's no moderation. There's no moderation in anything. Uh, you know, and, and I just I thought about this. I heard the other day uh, the lottery was up over $500 million. So if you was to play that, and if you was to win... Would that make you happy? Now, I'm going to be willing to say for <laughs> first week or two, you're, you're probably going to be elated. But would you eventually run out of stuff to buy? And But don't you see how, think about our lives and how we work and save and scrimp to buy what? Stuff that, is not going with us to heaven, but moderation. You know, every, some things are good in moderation, but if you get too much of them, you know, I love pizza. Anybody else in here love pizza? If I would quit at half of the pizza, I would be great. Sometimes I don't quit. I did. I was very proud of myself the other day. I left two pieces in there. I'm not going to tell you what size it was. That's not important. important thing is I left two pieces. Pizza is good in moderation. One thing that's not good is sin. And where he wants us to go tonight, what he wants us to understand, is a little bit of sin leads to a whole lot of sin. You know, it's no secret about the teacher or the coach that got arrested this past week in Dardanelle for having relations with a 14-year-old girl or 
14 or 15 year old girl. Folks, that did not happen overnight. That led up to talking, flirting, and I, I don't know this, but I've done, I've seen enough of those to know it probably then texting uh, and sending messages and at inappropriate times and then probably inappropriate pictures. It's all a pattern. It always happens pretty much the same way. And then the relation. You see, a little bit of sin is so deadly because it leads to a lot of sin. Now, you may say, I'm trying to think of a good example, but just say you bumped into Ken today, and, well, I'll use me, because my family will back, back me up on this. When my shoulder's hurting, I'm not very pleasant to be around. Amen? Thank you. And I'm sure it makes me, uh, but it just wears on my nerves, and I get cranky, and I'm short, and I just, you know, I, I snap back. Well, say you run into me that day, and that's how I was. And then Ken comes back to church and he tells Miss Joyce, I think Tony's taking steroids. He he just or some kind of drugs. He's just so mean and he just snapped, you know. Now if that's where it stopped, would that be that big a deal? Probably not. Because Miss Joyce would go, Mm, I surely he just caught him on a bad day, you know. But then what if Miss Joyce picks up the phone? And calls Frankie and calls Diane and calls Miss Kay, calls Jeannie. And they don't call Mom because, you know, they're going to figure she knows I'm on drugs, but that's another story. And then it starts spreading. You know, it, we say it all the time, but what's the easiest sin? The next one. What's the easiest step to take? The next one. What's the easiest Sunday to miss church? The next one. Uh, that first one, once you miss it, the second one's easier, isn't it? And then the third one's even easier. You know, and I'm, I'm telling you, I'm not trying to ruffle any feathers, and I know nobody probably listens to this that would care, but these church services that caters to people's time, folks, that is so dangerous. We can't even give time to God. We've got a schedule, extra, you know. <coughs> where, When did it? When did it change? When did, do, you, do we really believe God needs to cater to us? He died on a cross for us. Surely to goodness, we can get up on Sunday morning for the early service. I mean, and we don't have to put the bistro in the front of the church with the coffee machine so everybody can roll in at 1 o'clock and have their coffee and listen. I'm not saying that there's anything inherently wrong with that, but what I'm saying is look at what we're doing. Look at the steps we're taking. A little bit of sin grows into a lot of sin in a hurry. And I, I know I've used this before, but I love this. And I know all of you know, a little dab of do you. What is that? Brill cream. That's my folks. Got some seasons in their sun. There you go. We've seen some commercials. Sin is the same way. You know, and, and I don't even want to go down this. You know how many marriages have been destroyed by people looking up former boyfriends or girlfriends on Facebook? They're married and everything's hunky-dory, but one day they're just a little bit bored and they're on, they're on the computer and they think, oh, you know what? I'll look up oh so and so. And there they are. And what do you start thinking? You start thinking about the old times. And what what's the next thing? That that's step one. You've done took that step. Well, I'll just message them. Well, then there goes the message. And then guess what? Here in a minute you're talking. And well, they're saying things aren't good in their marriage. And I was really the love of their life one step after the next step after the next and it leads to big and dangerous things and you see the enemy knows that sin is the same way that a little needs leads to a lot 
You think Satan would be happy with just a little sin in our life? What does he want? Total destruction. But you see, sin is the work of the flesh. And I want you to hear this tonight because this is not being preached in a lot of places. Sin will not be tolerated by God. Now, please do not get me wrong. I'm not talking about your salvation tonight. If you truly gave your heart and soul to God, my Bible tells me you are sealed, which means the devil cannot take you out of God's hand. But what does sin do in your life? What does sin do to the saved person? It interrupts your walk with God. It interrupts your communication with God. Now, how many of you, either for your life, well, for all the above, for your life, you pray for your children, you pray for your grandchildren, and you want them to walk in God's path, and you ask for answers, and you seek God, don't you want to hear from God? Don't you want to know that you're on the right track, that you're doing the right thing? Of course you do. Well, what can interrupt that communication? Sin. And like Sister Joyce said a minute ago, folks, we need to keep that sin under the blood. I bet I'm not the only one in here that sinned last week. <laughs> but I did. And I'm going to bet you did too. But guess what I did? I asked God to forgive me. And strengthen me. And let me not to do that as much. Help me, wean me off of that. Walk me away from it. And we talked this morning about focus. And folks, if we'll focus more on him and less of this world, we'll be in good shape. But if you would, turn with me to Galatians chapter 5. When you find that tonight, if you would stand for the reading of God's word. Galatians chapter 5, I'm going to start in verse 19. It says, Now... The works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day you've given us. Lord, we thank you for another opportunity to come into this house, Lord, and worship you. We thank you tonight, Lord, for the beautiful songs that have been sung. Lord, and we thank you for the testimonies given. God, we're just a grateful people tonight. Lord, as it comes to the preaching of your word, I just pray, Lord, you prepare this vessel by forgiving me of my sins, Lord. Wash me clean and prepare me to speak your holy word. And God, I just pray you forgive us all of our sins, Lord, and wash us clean, Lord, and prepare us to hear this word so that we can apply it to our lives and be what you've called us to be. And in Jesus' precious holy name, his children all prayed. Amen. There's a couple of words here I want to go over with you because if you read that, most words in that, we understand what they are. But there's a few that you don't use in everyday conversation. And one is lasciviousness. That is a sexual desire. A, uh, and it's not necessarily, it's not an appropriate sexual desire. Do we have lasciviousness in our nation today? Amen. Do we have men burning in a sexual desire for other men and women burning in a sexual desire for other women? We have adults burning in sexual desire for children. We have all kinds of things that are wrong. We have a burning desire for sex outside of marriage. We have a burning sexual desire for adultery. All these things is running rampant in our world today. And folks, it's played out on TV like it's normal everyday activity. And I want you to think about, think about a young child around 6th, 7th grade that watches TV all the time and their parents are not godly. Their parents do not ever talk about God. They give them no examples. And all they see on TV, do you think they would think 
that all this stuff is okay. They certainly would. Sedition. Inciting people to rebel against authority. We are so bad at this. Our own government tries to get people to attack our government to make them think it's part of the government that's attacking the government. And now they're wanting to make, you're going to love this, January 6th a uh, national holiday. They put it right up there with Pearl Harbor and 9-11. Folks, I'm going to go out on a limb here. I'm not a smart man, but when something stinks, I can smell it. I will guarantee you, maybe not in my lifetime, but in somebody's lifetime, they will discover that the party <laughs> who's crying foul arranged for that to happen. Those people that were going in there and attacking, it was their people. And they think we're going to believe this. But I don't want to talk politics. I want to talk spiritual. I want you to know it's discussed right here in the book of Galatians, and it's coming true today. And it is sedition, inciting people to rebel against authority. The last one I want to talk about, and we hear it a lot, but folks, this one is so active in the church today, and that's heresy. A belief or action at odds with what is accepted. There was a time in our country when this was accepted. This was the accepted. This was, uh, if you didn't know it, this was the first official school book in the United States of America was the Bible. Boy, how far we fell from that. But do you remember a time when you were growing up, you may not even have went to church, but in a community like Hector, there was an accepted behavior. And if you didn't behave that way, not that you were an outcast, but a lot of people would not have anything to do with you and there, until you fixed what? Your behavior. Now, if your behavior is not right, they want you to fix your attitude. Because basically what they're saying is there is no right and wrong. It's just interpretation. <coughs> Folks, there is right and wrong. And we've all known it ever since we were little kids. And where do you find it? Right here. Used to, our teachers were allowed to teach right and wrong. Discipline, and then all of a sudden one day, here comes this. If you don't want your child disciplined, sign this piece of paper. <laughs> and a teacher was afraid to do anything because they're afraid to get what? Sued. And then the kids don't get it at home, uh, and so then they get it nowhere. But the dangerous I see in this, and I'm not attacking mega churches. don't get me wrong. I, I'm all for them if they're preaching the word of God. But there's so many heresies being taught. They take part of this book, but they don't take all of it. And they'll go up to a point. And the biggest thing I hear, and we talked about this morning, the biggest word I hear abused in churches today is the word grace. They do not understand what grace is all about. They want to say, Lord, I'll get in trouble for this, but they want to take a Catholicism look at sin where Monday through Saturday you can live however you want to live and then just come in on Sunday and make it right with God. Now, Here's the danger. Do we sin Monday through Saturday? Yes. Is it intentional? I certainly hope not. I mean, every now and then it may. Every now and then we may be in Walmart, and I know that don't excuse us. But you know as well as I do the intent of your heart. And then when you sin... And you make it, are you supposed to make it right with God? Yeah, but I'm going to encourage you. Don't wait till Sunday. 
if you sin on Monday, make it right with God on Monday. And then I've noticed the Holy Spirit convicts me quicker and quicker and qu quicker the more I ask for forgiveness. So you see, you see the danger? They're, they're taking the truth and they're stretching it or adding to it. You know, it's, I wish I could remember, but it, it, it has, there was a story about a clock, a broken clock. You know, a broken clock is right twice a day. So you can take this, and I hope you have a discernment in you. When you hear something like this, it just makes the hairs on the back of your neck stand up. There's certain preachers that when they preach, I just get the willies. My, my hands start tingling, and I just have to, I have to turn it off because I know what they're doing. I hear what they're doing. And, folks, that's dangerous. Because how many people you know, oh gosh, uh, they done a study, Dr. J Dr. Jeremiah presented it, they done a study on Christians who regularly read their Bibles, less than 6%. So if you don't read this Bible, the only thing you're going to know is what you hear on Sunday. You better have a lot of confidence and who you're hearing it from. Because because they could tell you something like that, and you could believe it. But here's the thing. If you know this the way we all should know this, and the preacher starts preaching something like that, then that's when you all say, thank you, sir, for your service, but we no longer need you. You invite them to go down the road. But I see it, and folks, they're making a lot of money, and they're getting really big attendances. And why is that? Because at the end of the day, one thing none of us can de deny is we all really prefer not to be convicted of our sins. We don't really want to feel bad when we sin. And if you want to see a sign of somebody who is really like this, <laughs> when somebody confronts them with a sin... They will always do this. Well, so-and-so does this, or so-and-so does worse than that. They start making a defense of, for themselves by attacking somebody else. But the bottom line, and folks, I'm going to tell you, we could probably triple our number, number on that board. We'd probably have to knock a wall out and start building on. If we started putting out, hey, God's a God of love. You can live however you want to live. Just come on in. Come on in. We're not, we're not convicting. We don't judge. We love. Come on in. Live how you want to live. Where does that kind of thinking live, uh, lead, though? You know where it leads. You see, we all once lived that life. We all lived lost in sin. But once you meet Jesus, you can no longer live there anymore. You must move your residence. First Peter 4 and 3, For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. Now, if you look up banquetings, the Hebrew meaning, basically what that means to us is the high life. How many people do you day, see today living the high life? Do you know anybody that will not wear an article of clothes unless it has a certain brand on it? <coughs> I do. Uh, it must be the finest. It must be the best. Uh, if somebody comes out with something better, well, I've got to have it. You know, it, if, I, if my neighbor's got it, well, looky there, I've got to have it. And you see, this is Peter talking. So see, we forget that the disciples, they were sinners. They, their life, when they were living their life before they met Jesus, they were, they were living in sin. They still sinned after they met Jesus. You remember, Peter denied him three times. I wonder how many times we've denied him in our lifetime. We cannot live in that place anymore. We cannot abuse grace. Like I said this morning, grace 
is not a license to sin. Why can we not let a little of that old life back in? 1 Peter 2 and 11. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust which war against the soul. That is it in a nutshell. There is a war going on for your soul. Now, if you've already made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, is the war still for your soul? Nope. What's the war for? To keep you from what? Being an effective witness, an effective worker. The Satan loves nothing more than when he can make somebody fall from, we'll call it tonight, we'll call it grace. You know, what people don't realize is, you know, I can think back to, what was it, the 80s? 80s, somewhere in there when there were so many uh, church scandals. So many pastors caught having affairs, all this stuff, and pastors and their wife making all this money on the side. You know, all these things were happening. And, oh, what a black eye Christians got. I would just simply say, we don't know that they were Christians when all that was going on. Just because you're a pastor don't mean you're a Christian. Just because you're a Sunday school teacher doesn't mean you're a Christian. Just because you can sing beautifully in the choir doesn't mean you're a Christian. Just because you go to church every Sunday doesn't mean you're a Christian. You know what means you're a Christian? Is your relationship with you and Jesus Christ. How much of a relationship do you have? Do you talk to him on a daily basis? You know, now, now prayer... We've talked about this before. It's misunderstood a lot, but now do we need to find time to be by ourselves with God? Amen. It helps us tremendously. But how many of you just talk to him throughout the day? You know, little things. You know, I can remember back when we had to keep up with our gas receipts, uh, and you'd have to figure up your gas receipts at the end of the month. You always wanted to end. If you're pumping gas, you wanted it to end on an even number because it made it a lot of... You know, I can remember so many times in our PDQ, thank you, God. It end on 25 or 25, 25, 25, 50, you know, and I'd be out there, thank you, God. I'm, you know, I know these people standing beside me are looking at me like, what's wrong with him? He's thanking God over the gas price? No, I'm thanking God for the little things. Do you thank God for the little things in your life? It's easy to thank him for the big things, but folks, the little things... You know, we don't know how many times he bl he blesses us so much that I'm just afraid I miss some, so sometimes I'll just thank him. You know, the other day I know somebody would have thought I was weird. My wife called me. She said, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm just sitting in the living room. Well, I was sitting in the living room, totally dark, nothing on, just sitting there talking to God. Now, had somebody come up before they rung the doorbell, they might have thought something was wrong with me. But I need that. I need to talk to him. And I need to hear in my heart his direction for me. And I don't do that enough. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm guilty. I'll come in, I, I like to hit that button and watch Andy or what. But I do know this. The more I seek God, it seems like the less I enjoy what's on the TV. Anybody else the same way? And I know... You agree with me on this? There's getting less and less to watch on there. I mean, it. You'll have 800 channels, and you can't find nothing. And we all know that. But this war against the soul. That's it, folks. I, I I don't. We don't have to dig any deeper. God wants your soul, so you can go to heaven, and the devil wants your soul, so he can take you to hell. You know, Satan, when he was cast out of heaven, he took a third, a third of the people in heaven. That's a pretty good number. Now, numbers are very important in the Bible. And I've often wondered, I, I know there's no set number, but I just wonder if there's a third of the people that'll go to heaven. I don't know. I know we don't know that, but you know, I just like to play things out in my mind. But I do know this. It'll be a remnant. 
it'll be a small portion of the people because most people will deny God and most people will take the cares of this world and they will lose this war against the soul. But you see, the enemy is so good at deceiving us with little sin. And I know <laughs> I've never seen so much deception as I've seen in the past two years over our own health. Now, there's one commercial, and I, if you have not seen it, or if you're like me, if the commercial comes on, and as soon as the word COVID comes out, I can't get to the remote fast enough. And as soon as the news starts giving their bogus COVID numbers, I can't get to the remote fast enough. But there's one commercial I would encourage you to watch because they actually expose their lie to us right in the same commercial. And it is an African-American male, and it's an Arkansas commercial, and he comes on, and he's a very well-spoken, very well-dressed man, and he's encouraging you to get the vaccine. But listen to what he says. He says, me and my wife both got COVID. We lost our sense of taste and our sense of smell. And he stops right there for a second. And then he said, and then the vaccine come along. And he was like, oh, yes. He said, that is... He said, I saw that vaccine, and I said, yeah, because that is the difference between a ventilator and health. And I'm like, wait a minute. You just sat here and told me you had already had COVID and it done nothing to you, but you lost your taste and your smell, and that's it. And then they introduced the vaccine, and now all of a sudden you've got to have it to stay off a ventilator. Is the second time the key? They don't even realize how openly they're lying to us in their own commercials. Now, I'm not saying it's bad or it's good. That's not, that's not my point. Some people need the vaccine. I, I agree with that. But don't be lying to us and don't try to demand it. But I just have to chuckle when I watch that commercial. He admits he's had it. And admits it done nothing to him. But, but now, wait a minute. Oh, now there's a vaccine I can take. Well, that'll save me from the ventilator, from a disease you've already had. So it, it just blows my mind. And in the news and all them, you know, there's a reason this is happening. And I want you, it has nothing to do with COVID. I want you to know that. There's a, we are being, we are being set up for something. And it's going to be much bigger and much worse than COVID, I promise you. But this just a little bit won't hurt you. I've got a few verses here as we close. And I want to share a couple of them with you. One of them I did just for fun, but, but I also want to share it. But the first one, you ever heard just one beer won't hurt you? Come on, just one. Well, what does one lead to? Two, three, Ephesians 5, 18. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, I'm going to show you, if I was going to preach a heresy here tonight, if I was an alcoholic, let me show you how I would spin that verse. Let me read it to you again. And be not drunk with wine. Stop right there. And I'd say, but church, it don't say nothing about beer. It don't say nothing about vodka. It don't say nothing about rum. It don't say nothing about bourbon. It says don't be drunk with wine. So I can go drink all the beer I want to and it's all right. Anybody believe that? Of course not. They take, they, they'll take one little part like that and they'd stop, you know. Don't get drunk with wine. Stop, Period. They leave out wherein is excess. Excess of any kind of alcohol is going to get you drunk. But listen to the last part. This is what they would leave out. But be filled with the Spirit. Folks, we need to be filled with the Spirit. Here's the one I put in just for fun. You ever heard anybody say, well, I'm just going to go up there to the buffet line one more time. <laughs> just one more time. Proverbs 25:16. Hast thou found honey? 
eat so much as is sufficient for thee, lest thou be filled therewith and vomit it. Don't overdo it. Now, I realize <laughs> that's not talking about food. That's talking about us, our, you know, our spiritual. Have you found something good in this world? Are there things that are enjoyable in this world? Amen. Any of y'all, see, here's my problem. I have zero hobbies. I, I, could, I could get into playing golf. I tried it for a while, but if I was retired and had nothing else to do and somebody wanted me to go play golf, I, I'd have no problem with that. But I know people who go and play golf once, and then they want to go three or four times a week, then five times a week, and then pretty soon, instead of going to church, they go play golf. And you can do it with anything. You can do it with fishing, with hunting, with Razorback games. Just checking, see if the door's working back there. Uh, sports, uh, anything you want to mention. There are things down here that we really love to do. Amen? I used to really love to go on vacation. I'm going to rethink that one for a while, but, uh, you know, I enjoy messing with cattle, but I see how I could make that my life. I could see how that could spill over, and then pretty soon, you know, well, I need to go check that one. Uh, Jen, just tell them I ain't going to be at church this Sunday. Uh, I'll call somebody say, hey, could you fill in for me? And then next week, and then next week, are, are we... Six, uh, are we likely to do stuff like that? Because we are what? We're flesh. So, and I know this is not talking about food, but you, you know what? It, it fits food too. Uh, hast thou found honey? Is there something? Uh, Miss Kay, what's your favorite food in the world? Lord, pray for Miss Kay. <clears throat> uh, okay. Never mind. <laughs> Let's just say some of you really like steak. A good steak. Cooked to perfection. Do you think you would love steak as much if you had it seven days a week? No. Do you think God knows that about us? you think God knows that we need to hold back. I wonder why it says it here, if you found honey, if you found something good, take just as much to satisfy yourself, lest thou be filled, overfilled, and you vomit it, where you don't like it anymore. My family, some of my family had barbecue last night. I used to like barbecue. But when I got sick, like this says, I associate it with barbecue. Now, I don't want barbecue, don't want to smell it, and I will not watch you eat it. I will visit with you, but if you're eating it, I'm going to look over it sometime. I can't stand it. Do you think God knows that? Sure he does. Why do you think he limits? Why does any of you not let your kids have all the candy they ever wanted? Get sick. Get sick. And do you remember... Gosh, I don't know. I can remember. <laughs> you remember when they had the sweet tarts about that big around and there was three of them in a pack? I loved those things. I especially loved the red one. I'd give my buddy or whoever's with me the yellow one just because I was a really nice person. But I'd eat the, I loved the red one. And the main reason I loved them, I loved the taste, but it was also as a treat to get them because I didn't get them all the time. I think our Father knows us, don't you? And those special times, I believe this with all my heart, so many times when I'm from, and, and y'all may think I'm crazy and ask me to leave after night, and that's, that's fine, but so many times when I'm preparing a message and I'm talking to God, I'll be the only one in the house, and there'll be people walking around me. I see it, and I've, I've caught, I still catch myself. I'll turn 
to speak and there, there's nobody there. I know who it is. I know what they're doing there. I don't get that all the time. So it's really, really special to me. What if I got it all the time? Would it become unspecial to me? I believe it would. I believe our God knows our hearts and knows when to touch us and when to give us things, when to withhold things, and when to make us work a little harder, maybe to make us wait, maybe to give us a little patience. Our Father knows what we're thinking. He knows what's best for us, so we just need to trust Him and let Him have the will. But the last thing, and I'll close with this. I would say the majority of the people we know think excess of one thing would solve everything for them. Money. If I can just work a little overtime, if I can just do this one more thing, if I can just do this over, if I can just make a little more money, then everything will be happy. Matthew chapter 6, verses 31 through 33. Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. I'm here to tell you tonight, if you're a child of God, you don't have to worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear. God will take care of you. Now, do we have to be wise stewards? Of course we do. We can't go out and blow and, uh, you know, he don't want us down there at Oakland spending our race checks on number two because that's not going to work for you either. I know a lot of people that that was their retirement plan, and it don't work. What works? Save a little, spend a little, give a little, but I always tithe. But what really works above all that is just saying, God, what is your will? What do you want me to do? Is, is there somebody that needs help? Because, folks, I look around this room, every one of you are blessed. And there's people who need things, who need material things. Now, material things don't mean anything to God. And we just read, if we'll seek him, we don't have to worry about it, right? But let me tell you what material things are good for. For us to reach out to those people that are lost and help them with material things and say, hey, God bless me, so I want to bless you. And then, I, then you get to tell them about Jesus. That's what it's all about. So I just ask you tonight, are you trusting God with everything? Are you trusting him with your finances? Are you trusting him with your health? Are you trusting him with your family? Are you trusting him with your heart? Are you trusting him with your life? If your answer is no to any of those, in a minute, this altar will be open and you can come and you can work it out with Jesus Christ because what he wants is you to give him everything. And let him direct your life. If you would, stand with me all over this building tonight. I'm going to ask that you bow your head and close your eyes. This is a very personal, private time right now between you and God. You've heard the word of God. He's spoken to us. It was not by accident that you were here tonight. He's speaking to us. He's getting us ready. Is there something from your old life that's tugging on you? Or maybe there's just something in your life that's causing you to have doubt. Anything tonight that you need to lay down at Jesus' feet and let him carry your load, this altar is open. But I would ask first, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, he is knocking on your heart's door. And as the Reverend Billy Graham said, once you hear God's word, if your heart is convicted and you choose to leave that night without making it right, you will never be the same. You'll, always, you'll be a little colder than you was when you showed up, a little harder to reach. So if he's knocking on your heart's door, friend, 
I highly encourage you to speak to the master. Come and lay down your sins at his feet and he'll wash them away with his blood tonight. If you've already done that, and like I said earlier, there's just something in your heart that you need to make right. Maybe you just hadn't been giving him the time you should or whatever it is, I don't care. Tonight he wants to talk to you and he wants to make it right.